Jesus tells this story about the prodigal son. It's not a parable, it's a story. But Jesus does not start with the boy. He does not start there. He starts with the father. The focus is on the father. He started by saying there was a father. And when Jesus said that, that when the boy returned home, the father ran to him. You must transform your mind to the point of understanding the audience to whom Jesus was speaking. Because even today, if I said the father run, well, a lot of fathers run. But to his audience, to whom he was speaking at the time, this was the most shocking thing they have ever heard. This is the most horrifying thought. This is an astounding thing that has never been done. Why? Because running is for the servants. Running is for the slaves. Running is for the despised people. Running is for scared people. Running is not for a dignified older man. Never, never, never you would see that in the Middle East, particularly in the time of Jesus. Those who were listening to Jesus tell the story were astounded. Because the Bible speaking of God humiliating himself in the Son, taking the form of a servant, die on a criminal cross, yet he's perfect in every way, then rises again so that every person who repents of their sins find God runs in the cross. There is no doubt that this boy was cocky. He was rebellious. This boy was the epitome of arrogance. He was selfish and self-centered, and he couldn't care less. He was thoughtless. He was indifferent toward his father. But, beloved, let me tell you something. That's exactly what every one of us were, spiritually speaking, before we came to God. That's how each of us were. But it was the father in Christ who died on the cross who's the focus of the story. You can almost hear this, this boy's uh, uh, pompous attitude when he said to his father, give me what is mine. Again, you've got to understand in the context of the Middle East of that time that if a boy would do that to his father, he would get the back of the hand and be told in Yiddish or whatever he was <laughs> they say back then <laughs> what's yours you got nothing get out of here but that's not what the father does the word parodical means extravagant it means it, it means rebellious and here's a word for parents if you allow your children to live extravagant life you are creating a parodical in your own home if you don't set clear boundaries around them you might be creating a parodical in your house. I know I hear some parents say, well, I want to give my kids everything I did not have. Well, if you want to create a parodical, give your kids everything. Back to the story. So a few days later, he takes his inheritance, converts it into cash, presumably. And then he left his father's house. And as the boy takes off, he's leaving behind a community uh, that he saw as an embarrassment. Uh, he left behind an older brother whom he detested. He, he left behind a broken-hearted father, and he burnt all his bridges. He wanted to wipe the slate clean, or at least he thought he did. I mean, he was really going to live it up <laughs> in freedom away from his parents, and at least he thought he did. And so when he gets into the big city, the Bible said he scatters his money. It's the word used for a, a farmer scattering seed. He, he was just spending it like we would say a drunken sailor. And he thought the money could buy him friendship. He thought that the money could buy him happiness. He thought that the money could buy him contentment. He thought that the money could buy him uh, acceptability to the society and to the culture of that city. But when the boy's money ran out, you would think, okay, I ran out of money. I better go back to 
my father. But the boy had some pride left in him. He was not ready to humble himself yet. Probably every time he thought of returning to his father's house, pride came in and said, you don't want to crawl to your father, do you? <laughs> you can't bring yourself down and, and ask for forgiveness. You can't live under your brother's roof and eat your brother's food. He would enslave you. And what will the neighbors say? What would the people of the village say? They're going to point out to you and say, ah, look at the big shot. <laughs> He thought he's a big shot. He thought he's going to the big city. He got religious now that he got into trouble. Some of you here and some are watching and, and listening right now. Right now. You've heard the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard God's invitation to come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard it from a spouse. You've heard it from a neighbor. You've heard it from a friend. You've heard it from a colleague. You've heard it from a preacher. You've heard it in a book to come to the only one who can truly forgive all of your sins, the only one who can give you salvation, come to the only one who can truly give you eternal life, come back to the only one who can truly give you peace and joy and contentment in life. Ah. <laughs> but you're postponing. Not today. Not now. You're putting it off. You're hearing another voice coming in. Every time there's an invitation, the Lord's Holy Spirit speak to you, there's always another voice. There's always another voice that will speak to you. You don't want to do that, do you? To make things worse, where the boy was in that city, there was a famine, drought. There was an economic depression. We don't know what that's like. And that's why I'm convinced that the one thing, the number one thing that keeps people from coming to Christ and accepting his free gift of salvation and eternal life is pride. Pride. Pride in your religion, pride in your philosophy, pride in your way of life, pride in this and pride in that is keeping you from coming and humbling yourself and receiving salvation from the only one who can give it to you. Pride will keep you in misery. Pride will steal your joy. Pride will destroy your peace of mind. Pride will keep you from heaven. Will you surrender your pride and come to him today? What a great day would that be. Surrender your pride to the only one who can truly forgive your sins, the only one who can truly heal your wounds, the only one who empowers all of your weaknesses, the only one who can give you victory in all of your defeats. Luke 15:15 15, 15 said that the prodigal decided to come up with some novel, marvelous new idea nobody ever thought about before. Get a job. Imagine a Jewish boy in a Gentile land trying to get a job in times of economic depression. I mean, just imagine that. For a Jew, feeding the pigs is truly the bottom of the bottom. But the truth is, the bottom is where everyone who rebels against God's invitation is going to end up. It's the bottomless pit not only in this life, but for eternity. Pigs back then ate garbage. They really did. They lived on garbage. But in times of economic depression, there was a shortage of garbage because people were eating the garbage. And so pigs were eating some dry pods. And the parodical was in such dire straits that the pig's food looked so good, but he couldn't get it. He couldn't find it. And beloved, listen to me. Spiritually speaking, some of you may be at the rock bottom right now. Rock bottom of your addiction. Rock bottom of your indulgence. Rock bottom of your morals. Rock bottom of your emptiness and loneliness. Rock bottom of your misplaced priorities in life. For this prodigal, the pigs were better off than he was. 
Imagine the utter despair. <laughs> Imagine the complete hopelessness. Imagine the helplessness of this young man. Imagine the confusion. What would he do? How could he go back to his father? How could he swallow his pride after what he said about his father? What a denying of God, denying the sovereignty, denying everything about the Father in heaven. How could he humble himself? How could he return to a loving Father? And my friend, this may be happening to some of you here today. Your pride is holding you back. No doubt every time you hear the Lord's invitation and you hear the Lord's voice, I love you, come to him who truly loves you, to come to him, the only one who can truly forgive you, the only one who died for you, to come to the only one who can take you to heaven. The devil gives you a hundred excuses as why you shouldn't. Every time. You don't want to do that, do you? You want to become one of those Christians. I mean, you, you laughed at them, you mocked them, you, you even made fun of their God. Well, you're not going to be one of them, are you? And on and on and on. How do I know that? Because I was there. Then finally, Jesus said, the young man comes to his senses. The Aramaic word that Jesus uses means repentance. He really came to a genuine repentance. And so he begins to write a speech. When I see my father, I say this and this and this. No, 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 that might not work. I think I'm going to say this and this and this and this. So he's writing his speech. Listen, I know there are people who think that there is a certain formula that when you come to Jesus, they have to use certain words. Or there's a specific prayer that you have to use somehow. It's got to be this and it's got to be that. Let me tell you something. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and accept his invitation of the one who died on the cross for you, not many words are really necessary. Father, forgive me. I repent of my sins. That's good enough. And so this parodical realizes uh, that he was not worthy. He was not worthy of his father's forgiveness. He, he was not just sorry that he wasted money and wasted life. He was not just remorseful over his condition. He was not just sorry that things did not work out the way he really hoped that they work out. He was not just sorry that his plans uh, failed. He was not just merely uh, coming for more money. He was coming with deep repentance, genuine repentance. Listen, I've met many people through the years who are remorseful, but not repentant. There's a world of difference between the two. This parodical was repentant. He grieved over hurting the heart of the Father. He grieved over bringing shame to his father. He was no longer arrogant. He was no longer cocky. He was no longer prideful of his foolishness. He thought of himself not worthy even to be in his father's household. He was asking to live in the servants' quarters. He wanted to be one of the servants. He wanted to make up for what he had messed up. He wanted to pay his debt. He hoped for a servant-master relationship with his father. But, beloved, the good news is when you come to Jesus Christ, you're not going to have a slave-master relationship with God. You're going to have a father-son, father-daughter relationship with God. That's the good news of the gospel. You see, when this boy left home, he says, give me. But when he came back, he said, make me. There is a world of difference between give me and make me. 
the world of difference between those two attitudes. One is the heart of arrogance. The other is the heart of contrition. He left home a son, came back willing to be a slave. He got what he wanted and lost what he had. Now he's ready for whatever he can get. Spiritually speaking, are you in that far country? Today, you can come to the Heavenly Father. You can accept His invitation. He's waiting for you. He's longing for you to come back to Him. See, when the prodigal left home, he called it independence. When he was living in sin, he called it pleasure. When he lost his money, he probably called it bad luck. Ah, but when he came to his senses, when he came to himself, he called it sin. He called it sin, missing the mark. The Bible said sin is fun for a short period of time. It is. In fact, Hebrews 11.25 said, There is pleasure in sin for a season. For a season. Sin is fun until you feel the deep scars that is impossible to remove. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, the prodigal came to himself. Why? Why did he come to himself? Listen carefully. Because sin blinds us. Sin uh, causes us uh, stupor and, and, and foolishness. When the boy repented and returned home, the father stripped himself of his dignity by running. The father expressed humiliation. By running, the father gave up his splendor by running. And this is a picture. This is the whole gospel. This is the Christian faith in a nutshell. The picture here that Jesus is giving us is that God the Father was reconciling us to himself through the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible said Jesus humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. He could have come with power. He could have come. He could have intimidated us. He could overwhelm us. He took a form of a servant so that whomsoever, whomsoever would come to him in repentance and in faith will find forgiveness and eternal life. That is why when the repentant boy came back and started making his speech, Remember, he's preparing it. He's been writing it in his head. When I see the Father, I say this. When I see the Father, I say this. And I say this. So he comes back and he begins his speech. After the first sentence, the Father stops him. Just got the first sentence out. And the Father will stop. Why? Why not let him finish his speech? The father heard exactly what he needed to hear, and that's enough. What about the rest of the speech? It was not necessary. Repentant sinners cannot be slaves to God. The apostle Paul, Jude, the brother of Jesus, I know I'm for one. I am honored to call myself a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ. But that's what we call ourselves. God calls us son. He calls us daughter. That's how he sees you when you come to him in genuine repentance. That's how he sees you. Can you feel the grace of God? Can you comprehend that grace? The grace is indescribable. It's inexplainable. And when you come to him, he will treat you as if nothing happened. When you come to him, he will treat you as if you have never sinned. Oh, but Father, what about the past? What past? What past? Oh, but Father, what about the mess that I'm... What mess? What mess? It's all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. 
when the Bible says that God remembers our sins no more when we repent, it does not mean somehow God is going to get a form of amnesia and that he's just not going to remember. Now, when the Bible says that he remembers our sins no more when we repent, the Bible is saying that he will not hold our sins against us anymore, especially on the day of judgment. He will remember our sins no more. He will not hold them against us. But before I conclude, I want to say something else that's very important. Some of you who are probably brought up of thinking that you've got to try harder, you've got to work at it, you've got to do this, and you've got to do the other thing, and you've got to improve yourself before you can even come to God. Listen to me. This boy did not stop out on one of those public bathhouses outside of those villages, got himself all cleaned up, washed up, spiffed up, dressed up, shaved, put some cologne, so that the Father can accept him. No, 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 no. He came just as he was. Just as he was. All he needed to do is to come with a heart of repentance. And it's only a repentant heart that God is looking for. He's going to do the rest. He's going to do the rest. He's the one who did the washing. He's the one who did the cleaning. He's the one who dressed him up, uh, put on his robe of righteousness because all of our robes like dirty rag in front of God's, only that robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ can really, really forgive us and makes us sons and daughters. Like the old song goes, just as I am without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come. Thank you for watching this program. Uh, leading the way, which is the ministry inside the Kingdom Sat, I bring it to you every day in English, Arabic, and French in the hope that God will use it to minister to you and to your needs. And I pray that God has led many of you to greater and higher depth in walking with Him as a result of Malakot Sat. God bless.